Please join me in welcoming Kenneth Cole and Amy Levin. Thank you so much, and we're very excited to be here. So, as the Dean had mentioned, you're celebrating 30 years of being in business. Let's start with how it all began. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dean Anderson. Um, so I um, started on this road that I'm on 30 years ago. I was seven at the time. <laughs> and um, I wanted to start a business, and I knew, is you guys here by the way? This yeah. And I, and I knew that I had to, I, that I, I knew then, not much different than today, that most startup companies I think it's 60, 70 percent don't survive the first year in business because people invariably underestimate how much they need to get through that critical point where there's a return on 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 uh, investment and also how much time they need. And so I knew I knew I needed to move quickly. So and it, that was prior pre Google. Yes, there was a time Google didn't exist, and <laughs> I didn't have the time to find out if I could get a made-up name cleared through the trademark processes. So I, I attached my own name to the business because I needed to make business cards and, and stationery and I needed to apply for a trade show and I needed to introduce myself to factories and packages. So I used my own name because you can almost always get your own name um, somehow uh, cleared as long as it's real. And I knew it would make my mother happy. So <laughs> I <laughs> called the company Chemical Inc. and I went to Italy knowing I had a better chance of getting credit from an Italian shoe factory that needed business than from an American bank that didn't. And I designed the cool one and made shoes and I came back and sell it. So at that time, you had two choices. You could um, take a room at the Hilton Hotel and I'd be one of 1,100 or so companies, 30 some odd companies per four, 30 fours. Buyers would come, walk all the floors, look at all the universal alternatives and they'd make their choices. Not very compelling, not a, a, an optimum way to distinguish oneself and not, a way, not an easy way to um, introduce oneself to a co very competitive industry. So the other alternative was to take a big fancy showroom within a two-block radius of the Hilton Hotel in New York, 6th Avenue um, and in the mid-50s. So Clearly, I didn't have the time or the money for that either. So I, on a whim, I called a friend of mine in the trucking business, and I said, if I could figure out how to park one of your 40-foot trailers on the corner of 6th Avenue and 56th Street next week, will you lend it to me? And he said to me, sure, jerk, this is New York. You can't park a bicycle for 10 minutes, let alone a truck for three days. And I said, if I could figure out how to do it, will you lend it to me? He says, I'll not only lend it to you, I'll help you decorate it. So I called the mayor's office, it was Mayor Koch at the time, and I said, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, how does one get permission to park a 40 foot trail on the corner of 6th and 56th Street? The answer is, sorry, son, they don't. It's New York. We get permission only under two circumstances. If you are a utility company servicing the streets, AT&T or Con Ed, or if you are a production company shooting a full-length motion picture, because we were going through an I Love New York campaign in the early 80s. So I said, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I hung up the phone. It wasn't really the mayor. And I <laughs> went to a stationery store that afternoon, changed my letterhead from Kenneth Goink to Kenneth Goink Productions, Inc., Filed for a permit the following morning for permission to shoot a full-length motion picture called The Birth of a Shoe Company. I opened for business on December 2nd. I had two New York policemen as my doorman, compliments Mayor Koch. And <laughs> I had a director. Sometimes it was filming his camera, sometimes it wasn't. And we made every buyer in the industry wait behind a stanchion cord. The more important the buyer, the more we made him wait. And we sold 40,000 pairs of shoes in two and a half days. And... Um, and the company has since, is still to this day, called Kenneth Cole Productions. We were traded on the New York Stock Exchange for 20 years. We just went private this past year. Um, a very monumental <laughs> moment in my career. And, um, but we tell that story because, to remind ourselves consistently that the best solution is rarely the most expensive, it's almost always the most creative. And, and that has somewhat defined our journey. And has Kenneth Cole ever created a film since you are technically a production company? So, <laughs> that was a loaded question because we just created a film. 30 <laughs> years later, I am also, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes, I'm also chairman of AMFAR, the largest AIDS research organization. 
And um, AMFAR was founded by two extraordinary women, um, a Swiss scientist named Dr. Mathilde Krim and a Hollywood icon named Elizabeth Taylor. And it's two women came together. It's an extraordinary story of two very strong-willed, very focused, um, very dedicated, devoted individuals who together created something bigger than either of them individually called AMFAR. AMFAR has gone on today and made a profound difference in millions and millions of people's lives. So as chairman today and also in the Board of Sundance, I wanted to get that story told. So I executive produced a film called The Battle of AMFAR. It opened in Sundance this year. It's gonna, it was, it was, um, it was bought and partially underwritten by HBO and they are airing it on World Aids Day, actually December 2nd of this year. You can see the film, which is our 30 years in the making. Amazing. So let's actually talk about that. Since a lot of your business in advertising has been done in a provocative way to raise awareness about various social causes, why is it that you have done this and, and taken that path? So when I started the business, I, I, I've al I always have known that A, the, our goal individually and collectively is always we want to be relevant. We want to somehow, everything we do is somehow needs to have some relative relationship to everything else around us. So in, that, in the fashion business, you're always out there kind of exploring the universe of what's there, usually so that, not so that you know what to do, but usually so you know what not to do. And, but in, in that, there was a period of time in the 80s where there was this pervasive consciousness across this country and everybody was wanting to be part of something bigger than they were individually. So there were these initiatives which many of you won't know about but maybe you've heard about um, called We Are the World, Live Aid, World Aid, Hands Across America. There were, and it was pervasive and everybody was wanting to get involved in something bigger than they were. But for the most part, it was about hunger and to a large degree hunger in Ethiopia which although not important was relatively remote and, and it seemed to me odd that so many people would be some, so emotionally committed and de dedicated. So then I realized I too wanted to use my limited resources and truly limited resources in those days. I've only been in business a year or two to, to talk about something important. And probably what was most important was what nobody was talking about and it was AIDS because you couldn't speak about AIDS in the 80s. Because if you spoke about AIDS in the 80s, you were presumed to be at risk which meant you were either Haitian, you were an intravenous drug user, or you were gay, none of which were socially acceptable. I was a single male designer, so everybody just knew I would be presumed to be Haitian. And um, <laughs> so um, I, it, it was this unique opportunity to talk about the fact that nobody was talking about AIDS. And so I did a campaign then, and, and I, God, I, I reached out to Annie Leibowitz, a well-known photographer then, as she still is today, and Annie and, a, um, and all these wonderful, the faces of the fashion industry all came together and lent their celebrity, lent their platform, and we did this campaign. And it changed me, cha redefined the company, redefined the brand, and, and, it, ha and it hasn't changed since. I, I was asked to join the board of Amphar in 1987, um, and AIDS, by the way, was just named in 1985, just so you have a context to that. Also, you should know, Ronald Reagan didn't mention, the, he was the president of the United States at the time, he didn't mention the word AIDS publicly until 87, until 40,000 people had already died. And then only then he mentioned it only once, and it was at an AMFAR event. So, um, so I was asked to join the board of 87, I did. I was asked to become chairman in 04, um, about nine years ago. And, and I agreed to do it um, on certain, under certain conditions. And, um, but Amphar, you should know today, there's four people that have been clinically cured of AIDS. Amphar played a role in all four. There are four out of six drugs today that are keeping millions of people alive today around the world that have roots in Amphar funding. So Amphar has had a profound impact on the trajectory of this disease. And, um, and I've been very fortunate to have been able to play a, a role, some leadership role and, some, and, and a creative leadership role um, in the organization. And it has, and it's one that I have stayed with. So, um, so I, the, that path and the ability to connect our business agenda going forward to a greater social agenda has kind of,
taken hold and is a big part of who we are and what we do yeah. um, every day. Do you feel like that your role in philanthropy and the various social causes has ever conflicted with your traditional fashion business? And I think more specifically when you're a public company. Good question. <laughs> so so when, I, when I was public, I used to get a lot of feedback. Well, you know, as a public company, it's really right for you to be talking about these social issues and, and, uh, and, and or political issues. And, and I'd say, you know what, A, it's what I always did. If you bought the stock, I was doing it before you bought the stock, and I'll be doing it after you sell it. And so, but it's what the brand has always stood for. Um, and, and, the real, and also, they're not political issues. They're social issues, and maybe they're human issues, but they're not political issues. So, and, that, and we've just always done that. Um, and, and I found ways somehow to very much attach them to the business agenda. I'm gonna give you one other um, business dilemma that I had and how we used it to kind of redefine um, our relationship with the community. In the early 90s, we, I had opened a store in New York on Columbus Avenue, a, a little boutique, and I'd opened one in San Francisco on Union Street, and which is what you need to do if you're gonna be a designer business, because you need to define your brand on your terms, um, the way you want it seen, the way you want it interpreted, by who, to whom you want it interpreted. So, um, but the problem is, is that most of my business was being done with it by the department stores at the time, with Bergdorf's, Goodman, and with Macy's still, and. Bloomingdale's, and, and the problem is you can't sell anything for a dollar less than they're selling it, and you can't sell it differently than they're doing it, and so it's for, the business model is very difficult. So in New York, in the month of February, we had this dilemma because the, we were doing very little business because we had mostly um, summer shoes because you'd sell, sell all of your fall inventory either on sale right after December and then maybe into January, and and then come February, you want to have transitioned into summer product, but the problem is it's still zero degrees in New York right. in February. So, um, but what I did was so. But how do you drive traffic? How do you, how do you kind of justify kind of the complexity of the needs of the business? So, what I what I did was. I I realized that there was this population in New York, this underserved population in New York. Um, relatively new, by the way, called homeless. And they, homelessness is very new in this country, maybe in the last 30 years. There used to be the social safety net that took care of, to the large degree, those that needed to be taken care of. And, and then all of a sudden, there was neither the will or the resources politically to continue to do that. And the problem is, is, that, is that politically they didn't have a vote. Polit the political, politically nobody really paid attention because these guys didn't vote. And the community didn't really pay attention, um, business community didn't pay attention because they didn't spend. So they were a, a relatively ignored um, uh, constituency group with, with a, which was, a, and it was heart-wrenching and it was existing everywhere and it was growing everywhere. So what we did was we started a campaign, um, a shoe drive, and we said in the month of February, bring in a pair of shoes. First it was a pic big picture of a homeless man, full page New York um, Magazine and it said, um, unfortunately, too many people would love to be in your shoes. And then we say, bring in a pair of shoes you no longer wear for somebody that will, and we'll give you a discount on a new pair. Now, we weren't going on sale. We weren't com competing unfairly with our other customers. We were creating a community initiative that created goodwill, served the population that could benefit from our efforts. And the campaign was extraordinary, it is, it is, and we've collected since several million pair of shoes. It's something that we do every year, and shoes, and then we've added in bags and clothes, and, and it's something the industry now does that we had defined, and it's a shoe drive, or it's a coat drive, or it's a clothing drive, and it's a way to serve this underserved and, um, and uh, um, population in need. And, um, so that was another thing that's become very defining as part of the business. Yeah, it's incredible, all the different philanthropies that you do and that you're a part of. So obviously social media is huge these days. All of you guys are on it, we have it streaming. How have you seen you know, social media affect your business? And even more from a college student standpoint, what advice can you give them to start to create their own brands while they're in college through the use of social media? So. The, the world has changed in, um, 
in so many ways that nobody could have imagined. I had a, a, um, a writer recently asked me a question in, in an interview. So where do you think, so we get it, things have changed. So where do you think we'll be in five years from now? And I said, that's an irrelevant question. You can't ask it anymore. She said, well, why is that an irrelevant question? I said, because five years ago, if, I don't know about you, but I didn't know what tweeting was. <laughs> I didn't know what pinning was. I didn't know what posting was. I didn't know what Instagramming was. Um, and I didn't know what, what, um, what uh, texting or sexting was. <laughs> and What's sexting? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll tell you something, though, except for the latter, the last part. I, it defines <laughs> me today. It defines how our business... <laughs> it defines how we do business. It defines how our company communicates with our target audiences. It defines how, um, how everybody today communicates with each other. And the other reality today, clearly, is that I've also come to realize that, that m my job as a designer, first of all, it's not to tell you what you need to wear. It's to, tell, it's to find out what you want and give it to you, but not how you expect it. But that aside, it's also to recognize that you're going to define yourself invariably not by my brand but by your own and I need to recognize that and my goal is to try to be a part of your brand and everybody today almost everybody today and literally almost everybody today curates their brand on their terms they do it on their Facebook page they do it on their Pinterest page they do it on their Instagram feed on their um, and uh, um, on their Twitter feed and they define everything that kind of intrigues, compels, that interests them. And they curate it daily. And then they curate the audience that has access to it. And they invite you to, to become part of their brand, to give them, you, they decide who can have access to their brand and who can't. And, and so everybody has their platform and they have their, they've curated their audience. Now what happens exponentially these audiences and these brands re interconnect and these platforms enable that. And the world's gotten really small. Yeah. And today fashion happens everywhere in real time. And um, the ability to connect to massive amounts of people in real time is overwhelming. And I don't think anybody could have anticipated this even a few years ago. Um, and it's totally changed the way to whom we speak, how we speak, um, and the, the, and the mechanisms that are available to us. So do you think it's easier today to become a designer than in the past because people have the ability to connect with an audience immediately? Whereas in the past you had to go and find consumers in the audience you were looking to address. So in the past, um, it, today it's harder because the, the competitive landscape is more difficult because everyone who does what you do everywhere is a competitor in effect and everybody has access to the same audience that you do um, through um, this place called the World Wide Web. And, um, but what's distinctive though is on the other side of the equation, you have access to this yeah. large audience that you never had before. So I think the landscape becomes a little more competitive but the opportunity is much bigger. And the ability to bring anything to scale is, is so much greater than it's ever been. And that doesn't just happen in the commercial universe. It happens in the political universe. It happens um, out there in, in educational research. I was talking to Dean Anderson before about how education is changing and how people today have access to the greatest minds and the greatest thinkers. You don't need to go to an esteemed university to get a great education. And you get a great educational experience here, you get it curated for you here, you leave with relationships you couldn't get elsewhere, but you can ha you can go into iTunes University, I don't know if any of you have done that, I, it, it, I'm confounded by what exists. You can, the greatest minds, the greatest thinkers, the greatest um, presentations of, of, of thought and ideas and are available to everybody and there's not even a charge to it, and no matter where you are, no matter what language you speak. So. Um, everything today has become accessible, but it's so exciting. And but those who and so and in business, for example, the businesses in business school, as I understand some of you are, 
you typically learn that your job, that the objective is to amortize your investment over as long a period of time as you can and hence realize the greatest return. The reality today is almost inverse. And unless you're prepared to abandon that investment and kind of re keep recreating, reinventing, and um, reconfiguring, you're going to, in all likelihood, um, not be able to keep up. And um, so, um, I don't know where I was going with this, but... Um, Faisley social media is just, it's changed everything. It's, it's changed everything. And so the, the businesses that have built a platform, what I tell people actually is that I've built a platform, and that's what I was actually saying to the editor, it's a big circle from <laughs> where I started the story. So, um, and the goal is to build a platform that, that um, thrives on change. It has the ability to, to identify it, to respond to it in a positive way. But then the businesses that are stifled by it, that resist it are the ones that in all likelihood won't be here in a few years. Right, I agree. So if you aren't following Kenneth Cole, you should be following Kenneth Cole on Twitter, Instagram. And Pinterest. Pinterest. And Facebook. Tumblr, Google+, Plus, <laughs> everything, pretty much. Yes. Well, Shameless <laughs> self-exploitation. Definitely. Kenneth and I have been on a month-long tour together, which has been lovely. Um, and the basis of it has been celebrating this book. So tell us about the process of creating this book. So it's been excruciating. <laughs> and I don't suggest you write books about your past, <laughs> um, especially since so few people seem to read books today. But right. this one is a pictorial, anecdotal um, journey over our 30 years. And it takes you through, it takes you, a lot of our messaging over the years has been a, somewhat unique. And we've gone places few have and others hadn't, a few had, and a few it would. And, um, and then we tell a little bit about the business story. So, but w I, I resisted it then because in my business, a, the story isn't told. Um, I believe the best part of the story is still to come. And also because in our business, if you spend too much time looking behind you in the rear view mirror, in all likelihood, you're gonna miss that next bump in the road. And, yeah. and it's critical that you stay, you stay absolutely focused on what's the opportunities at hand and where you're going and where, how you're gonna get there. So, um, and the book tends to um, be a, a big, uh, a big distraction. And it but, has that. Augmented. But it's a great book, though, and it has augmented reality, That's and cool. you can uh, download this application, and then you put it in front of the book, and then this guy Kenneth you Cole jumps out of the book, <laughs> and he says compelling things, and uh, yeah. and then you shut him down. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's, it's really a great book, and he'll be signing it afterwards if you haven't picked up a copy. So I think we should open it up to the audience and get some questions for you guys that you have. So feel yeah. free to raise your hand, and we'll con some people, and then we'll take some questions from Twitter. Who's going to be our Yeah, so we're, you guys can be tweeting questions. That was this, that's what this all, this is a yeah. little charade. It wasn't really meant to be texture, background, distraction, because I know, I see a lot of you guys looking over my head, <laughs> but it was... If, in fact, you really don't want to raise your hand, you can We're tweet your question. And if we don't answer it here, I'll try to answer it afterwards um, if I can. Yeah. Okay. So who's going to ask the first question? It's in the green. And say your name and stand up. And I think they have a microphone for you as well. Uh, I'm sorry. Say that again. You know, people ask me why I went private in, 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 a very, in a very short, concise response. Now I've come to say, because I could. And I've come to realize that there is no reason you want to be public today unless you have to, be, unless you need to be public today. And there is just, um, there's the oversight and the regulatory um, um, intrusion is so distracting to the runnings and the needs of everyday business. And the other reality too is the way you look at a business as a public company, a private company is significantly different. First of all, you're not really encouraged and supported in any effort to think beyond, you know, three months from now. Um, but that aside, a couple of examples in a public company, advertising is an expense. In a private company, it's an investment. Um, inventory in a public company, no matter what it is, is your biggest liability. 
in a private company, if it's good inventory, it's your single greatest asset. So just every way you look at the business, it's, um, it's smarter, it's easier, it, and it's more compelling to, to not be in the public arena. So um, I didn't know how great it would be, actually, because I'd, I'd, I was public for 20 years. And, uh, but so that's why we went private. So for many, for many people that don't know, a lot of designers show at Fashion Week and more specifically what's now become Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week. With the, com the commercialization of that venue and how they have sponsorships now, do you view it as a viable medium for designers to continue to go and show or do you view it now as more of a celebrity spectacle? So... Good question, Maria. You know, everybody has different reasons why they avail themselves of, of that process. So, because I left the fashion show um, business about seven years ago, because all of us, if I felt it was really distracting our whole team, all of our resources were being deployed ineffectively. Our creative resources, we are creating product for an editorial agenda of these few editors, and, but that none of whom paid the bills, that half of the product never made it to the stores, but it looked good, and it was editorial worthy. And, um, and, but our creative resources were being deployed, our financial resources were being deployed, our human resources were being deployed. So. I felt that I needed to stop doing that and hopefully fix the business, focus on who we were in business for is to create the right product for, the, for ultimately for the consumer. But then seven years ago, actually a few months ago, six months ago, I woke up one day and I said, wait a second. And also the problem six months ago is we are creating product and the internet had really come into its own about seven, eight, nine years ago. And then there was all around the world, there was this platform of this television platform, and almost in every global market, there was a fashion TV network that came, popped up because it was free programming and free content. And everybody was accessing all these free programming shows and they were just running them 24 hours. And anywhere you are in the world today, you can go through the channels, you'll find a fashion TV. And so what was happening is, is these shows are being seen and almost in every case, it's off season. I'm showing spring and these consumers are buying fall. Plus, in every case, my product isn't even available in the marketplace. So I'm frustrating a potential audience, customer, if in fact it's even a product that they would even or could even or should even consider. But then all of a sudden I realized a few months ago, wait a second, the world's changed. And, and social media has redefined the way people consume product. And consuming product today is not about going to the store and buying it. And it just isn't that. The fact is most of these designer shows sell product that is so... Um, it's so aspirational and it's just not ever really meant to be consumable and it isn't to 99% of the people that see it everywhere because of price point, because of accessibility or for whatever reason. But the way people consume product today is as I was saying before, they pin it, they post it, they tweet it, they retweet it. And so, um, and then if you, the goal is to become part of people's brands and for people to define, to be inspired by what you have to say. So I would, um, and I realized that this was a, a huge opportunity um, to reach this huge audience. And then what people do is they, you hopefully become part of how they define themselves. And then one day when they do want to buy product, they'll go to your website, they'll buy it in the color they want and the size they want for, the, for when they want. And, and that's ultimately um, how the process has evolved. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical opportunity today and today everybody if you're either you're, and if a brand today is relevant anywhere, it's essentially credible everywhere because of the globalization of fashion. And I do arguably make the case that fashion today may be truly the only real universal language um, because of how it is broadcast 24 hours in real time everywhere. And so, so we did the show, and I had a, in, in 360 degree um, projection, presentation of, but first it was a video that came on before the models came out. And, the sh and it said, first, it says, we, re at a, we respectfully request that all members of the audience take out your communication devices. Oh, out of respect for the people around you, take out your communication devices and turn them on. And, and then we went on to say that this 
show for the first time will be simultaneously broadcast on each social platform. And so every fifth look was projected on Twitter, maybe, or on Instagram. Twitter had few. And then Pinterest had most of them, but at the very end. And then Facebook had it all. And, um, and then it was live streamed on four different platforms. But today, everywhere, you know, no matter where you are, you could be lying in bed and you could be doing whatever you're doing and you could be experiencing, you, and you essentially are in the front row of every fashion show. So um, it's an interesting time right now. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and I would like to know if, if you give any advice for a student who wants to work in this industry since it's become so competitive with the social networking and the World Wide Web and everything else that we have in you. So I'm going to give you some advice. So it, it's become very competitive, but in some ways, arguably, it's less competitive because of what I said before, too, because you, you can really connect with people. But it, it's it's very much about, I go wake up in the morning and I look in my closet and I, and I say to myself, what do I wish was here? And, and I go to work and make it in effect. So, you know, the ability to kind of see, A, a what's not there, because there's so much that is, is a real talent. So what I urge people to do is, as a consumer, as an individual, um, you know, Kind of reflect on what you what you wish was better or was existed that doesn't, and and then um, have and define a real point of view, and to the degree you can bring it to market, that's to somebody who's looking to start a business, which you're not asking me how to do. So you're looking how to get into the industry, and I would urge you to this internship um, uh, culture that has um, grown everywhere is a very good one, and it gives everybody a chance to get to know. You give you, you get you can test drive. Um, an, an experience, and then I urge you when you get the chance to work somewhere, be great at it, and just commit yourself wholeheartedly to it. So, you know, I we were at um, at Penn, and I was speaking to a bunch of uh, Wharton uh, business students um, recently, and one of the students stood up and said, "So I went through this education. Obviously, you know, um, I've done well academically over the years. What is my next step?" And I said, you're not going to want to hear this, I don't think. But all of this education that you have paid for and that you've had access to and that hopefully you've benefited from gets you an interview. That's it. And the rest of it's up to you. And it's all about what you've learned throughout this journey, instincts that you've, that you've created and, um, and the knowledge that you've realized. But at the end of the day, you need to ultimately perform at every chance you get. You need to be great at it, but in, and ultimately you need to love it and then you will. Great question. So you are a father, you're a designer, you're a philanthropist. How do you do all these different roles? Husband, your wife is here. <laughs> um, drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so you promote drugs. <laughs> um, not really. I, you know, I, Look to find synergy in what I do because I try to do more than any sane, responsible, <laughs> appropriate person should do. And, and I and I, am very proud of the work I've done at Amphar and I love the work that I've done in all these various social um, frontiers. And, and, but I have a day job and I run a very complicated fashion business today, and, which is very complicated because we're doing business in lots of countries today and there's lots of classifications and there's lots of seasons. and on lots of platforms. Um, but what I try to do is to marry these agendas wherever I can. Um, and next week, actually, on, next, on Wednesday, I'm leaving, and I'm taking my wife and daughter with me, and we are flying to India, where we're opening our 10th store in Mumbai. And um, we are, the following day, going to have a very big Amphar event. And I'm bringing with me Sharon Stone and Kesha and, um, and a mess. few other people. And, we'll have, <laughs> and we will have a great... Amphar experience. We'll raise a lot of money for Amphar. And it'll be a great Kenneth Cole business um, experience. And then the f then right after that, we're flying to Bangkok. 
because one would think it's like not a big deal if you're over there, but meanwhile I found that it's eight hours and it is a big deal. But um, <laughs> so then we're going to Bangkok, where there's a, 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 a an AIDS conference, a regional AIDS conference, where I'm going to hopefully deliver an address, and and we're opening a new store in Bangkok. So I look to marry again, anyway, all of my various agendas and figure out how I can to the. And I do believe at the end, one plus one equals a lot more than two, yeah. when you're able to do that, and everybody benefits. So and and have my wife and daughter with me makes it that much more special. So I can burn them at the same time. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. It's been wonderful chatting with you. And you guys will have the opportunity to speak with Kenneth Bergen to go out and host sign books. And then for whoever didn't get to ask the questions on Twitter, you'll be answering them later. And thank you guys for having us at your school. Yeah. Also, just one other quick thing. Plug. Just another plug. Um, shameless self promotion. Um, <laughs> We, I'm doing a personal appearance on Saturday at Bloomingdale's in Aventura. If you guys want to stop by, um, I am just a terrible when you do these and nobody shows up. So <laughs> if you could come, I would appreciate it. And also, um, in your bag that you have in the back of your seat, which with a very provocative message, which says, um, uh, great, uh, great minds don't think alike, um, there's also a discount card, so you can use them in any Kenneth Cole store. And, um, and so you too could walk in my shoes. And, um, <laughs> and then there's a book outside. So happy to chat and thank you for all that you do and thank you for being here. Thank you guys.